Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kent Wong. I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center, and we would like to welcome everybody to this month's segment of Labor's Voice. This is a monthly broadcast of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor and the UCLA Labor Center that brings critical information to union members and friends and community activists in the greater Los Angeles area, but it is also streamed in other places throughout the country. And uh, we are very excited today to be joined by my good friend, Mary Kay Henry, the president of the Service Employees International Union. We will also be joined later in the program with April Barrett, the president of the um, Service Employees International Union, Local 2015, one of the largest unions in the country, representing over 300,000 home care workers in the state of California. And finally, we will be joined by uh, my good friend, Ron Herrera, the president of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, who this very week had the honor of being one of the electoral college delegates representing the state of California that put uh, Joe Biden uh, over the top and became uh, our uh, president elect. Uh, and so this is a historic week to be having a conversation with these three extraordinary labor leaders on what should labor do now? Uh, we've come off a historic election. There were more votes cast in the November 3rd, 2020 election than any other election in US history. And we are so excited that the nightmare known as the Trump administration is finally coming to an end, that the policies of racism, white supremacy, anti-union, anti-worker, sexism, misogyny, and uh, anti-immigrant hysteria will finally come to an end on January 20th, 2021, and we will be ushering in a new administration led by Joe Biden and our very own Kamala Harris, uh, the former senator from the state of California. And so uh, to start off today's program, I wanted to give a warm welcome to uh, President of SEIU, Mary Kay Henry, and to ask her specifically about some of the important roles that SEIU played nationally in mobilizing and in organizing the vote to ensure victory on November 3rd, 2020. So welcome Mary Kay Henry to Labor's Voice. Thank you so much. And thanks to the UCLA Labor Center, Kent, and your leadership and Ron Herrera from the LA Fed. Together, we're gonna to bring bold transformational change uh, to the essential workers on the front lines of this pandemic and to every community who showed up in record numbers. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wanted I to start by asking about the election itself, because yes. as you know, during the pandemic, this was a, a, a huge challenge for SEIU and other unions around the country that traditionally have relied on door-to-door, -door, mass rallies, mass mobilizations, and a lot of those um, methods of mobilizing the vote were not available in this election cycle. So how did SEIU overcome this challenge and what did SEIU do to successfully turn out the vote? Well, one thing that made a huge difference, Kent, is we never left the voters that we turned out in 18 in massive numbers in key battleground states in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Colorado, Florida. And we stayed engaged in those communities through all of the issue fights that people elected folks to office in in 2018. So we were door knocking for the presidential beginning in September of 19 and had been in the uh, communities where we were trying to uh, focus on and empower 6 million voters in communities of color who are infrequent in how they show up to vote because people don't speak to their issues and lives. 
and because of the inc intensifying voter suppression that's occurred. So one big difference was we had been door knocking September, October, November, December, January, and came off the doors in February, had relationships with voters that we could then turn into our, our remote um, communication. So we did Zooms with volunteer precinct leaders and help them think about texting and phoning of their family, friends, and neighbors. Two, we did a lot more worksite activity in the key places where we were trying to turn out the record vote. And three, our members got much better than they've ever been in using technology to communicate. So all of our retirees were trained on something we call purple text and they engaged hundreds of thousands of voters in the battlegrounds um, over the course of January to November. And um, initially were taught by their children and grandchildren how to use it, and then became teachers of other seniors who were scared of using texting instead of phoning. Um, but we had Oregon members show up in record numbers to help Michigan voters do early vote by mail uh, registration through their own experience and then would talk to the same voter four or five times. Did you get your um, application? Did you fill it out? Um, have you mailed it back in? Um, let me help you do it online. I'll send you the link right now and I'll walk you through it together. Uh, was the depth of the engagement we had and then we're staying connected to these voters now as we battle with the Republican Senate on getting COVID relief uh, this week. And then we'll stay engaged through a campaign that's called Respect Us, Protect Us, Pay Us, that will unite our fights as we demand government and corporations to do the right thing uh, by the people that are suffering the most from COVID, the economic collapse, the racial reckoning, and the climate crisis. Those lessons are so critical, Mary Kay, because SEIU uh, has uh, by far one of the most powerful organizing um, mobilization programs in the country. And it's been reflected in the steady growth of your membership over the years. Uh, and we also know that the strength of organizing is also the strength of the political mobilization capacity and developing those relationships. And so it was amazing watching this unfold in the field, especially during the pandemic when your members had to be very agile and to be very flexible in shifting their methods of organizing. Uh, the yes. other thing that distinguishes SEIU is you have um, a majority uh, women and a majority people of color membership, uh, which is, uh, which is um, significant uh, given the historic composition of the US labor movement. Tell me about how the communities of color working in partnership with SEIU were so decisive in this election victory. Well, in every um, community that we were turning out either Black, uh, Latinx, Asian, or Native voters, we worked in partnership with a community-based organization. So um, in Florida, it was the Color of Change Planned Parenthood Federation, uh, the Florida New Majority, that's a combination of immigrant and community-based organizations in the five key uh, places in Florida that needed to show up and vote in record numbers. And in Michigan, it was a combination of in Detroit, the Fight for 15, which has been an eight year long campaign that we've had with fast food, nursing home, airport and security workers, together with community organizations like Moses uh, and the Michigan Organizing Alliance. So it would be different in different places, but Ken, I think you're right. The key ingredient for SEIU is our members make up the, the breadth and depth of the power of uh, the American democracy. Uh, and so they're in relationship through churches and community-based organizations with the voters that we are prioritizing to turn out. One thing that SEIU has been very strong on is this whole notion of advancing multiracial democracy and yes. in uh, really pointing out the historic injustice that has been represented by the Electoral College and by massive attempts to suppress the vote, especially within communities of color. 
And so how did SEIU address that particular issue of voter suppression? Well, for the first time uh, in the history of our political program, we created a voter protection um, effort in three ways. One, we were working in collaboration with Fair Fight that Stacey Abrams launched after her uh, gubernatorial election, where her election captured the imagination of our members who understood, I think, across race uh, in a way that hadn't happened before, how um, the Republicans have been trying to rig the rules to exclude voters, purging voters off the rolls, limiting uh, access to polling locations, like the whole way in which voter suppression has been um, increasing. Uh, since the Supreme Court decision that stopped the federal protection um, on voting rights. So that's one thing that we um, armed our members who became democracy captains in some states or worked as poll watchers. We recruited 7,500 poll watchers beginning in September when we understood that there was going to be a contest over the actual ballot counts in the key path to 270. Um, and many of our members' children uh, who were more able to show up physically in places became volunteer uh, poll watchers. So that's the second effort. The third was we were part of a legal um, collective uh, that worked on using our members as plaintiffs uh, because of our role and relationship. We have many members in the communities that are targeted for voter suppression and easy access to a 24 seven turnaround on filing uh, lawsuits. So those were the ways in which we engaged. And then frankly, we educated our members beginning in October of 19 um, about this being a part of the uh, strategy by the Trump campaign uh, to win the, to steal the 2020 election uh, was through enhanced voter suppression. So we educated all of our member political organizers who then educated the volunteers that we recruited about uh, the need to, push through all of the voter suppression and ignore the disinformation that was being targeted to black and brown communities through the internet um, and show up and vote. It is so great that SEIU has uh, taken the lead in addressing voter suppression, which has been so uh, pervasive and so systematic yeah. in uh, the attempt to uh, uh, you know, hold on to power and to uh, block especially uh, communities of color. And I'm so glad you lifted up the extraordinary work of Stacey Abrams, who has inspired the nation yes. in terms of her um, massive voter mobilization. Uh, but I'd like to uh, ask specifically, uh, what is SEIU continuing to do in the ongoing fight to uh, secure victory in uh, Georgia with these two Senate uh, races that are still up for grabs? You know, Ken, I think for the whole labor movement, as soon as the November 3rd vote counts were happening, um, people started figuring out how can we um, move money marbles and chalk into Georgia. And so we've had local unions send experienced staff, which is what the Georgia community-based organizations and our locals asked for, um, that could mobilize members. We've taken more of our members who work in warehouse distribution and the city of Atlanta off the job to be a part of the GOTV operation. Our California locals have created a phone bank where they are targeting the turnout of a half a million voters. Um, our Spanish language um, members are targeting Spanish language and our API members are helping with Vietnamese turnout so that we have people speaking in the language of origin uh, to the voters that we need to shape. So there's outside phoning happening in coordination with the groups on the ground. And then we were proud to help raise money to back the efforts of the people throughout Georgia, both in the cities and in the rural communities. So we were not leaving any stone unturned and we were getting people to put voter um, vote by mail and voter turnout on their holiday lists. Uh, if you can <laughs> imagine in the midst of a spike in the virus and in the midst of the holidays, 
the Georgia voters are having to show up in record numbers all over again. And I think there's huge momentum on our side because Georgians face a subminimum wage of $5.75 an hour. They have uh, resisted expanding Medicaid to 700,000 Georgians. So wages and healthcare are at the top of the agenda. And we need Ossoff and Warnock to be sent to the US Senate so we can take bold action on both of those issues for the people of Georgia. That's great. Well, I'm so glad that the labor movement is still hard at work uh, yes. and have geared up to uh, secure these victories in uh, Georgia. Uh, let us hope that the uh, spirit and memory of uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, lifts the people of Georgia to do the right thing. Uh, and we really hope that uh, the momentum that Stacey Abrams and uh, her uh, friends and allies and supporters in Georgia uh, will work in partnership uh, to uh, secure victory uh, uh, come the next election. Um, you know, because the election was closer than many of us had hoped for, um, some within the Democratic Party are saying that this is an excuse for Biden to move to the center, that he needs to appeal uh, to people who voted uh, for the other candidate, and that we need to tone down uh, the demand for racial justice and the demand for immigrant rights. Uh, what is the position of SEIU with regard to some of these uh, positions within some within the Democratic Party? Well, we, we reject that analysis of the election and we reject the conclusion that it calls for the next Congress. We actually think that essential workers um, and voters in black, brown, Asian communities made the difference in this election and that they drove the conversation around the need for government to um, enact bold change that's gonna unrig the rules and make it possible for all workers to join together in unions to raise wages and create good jobs as we tackle the COVID crisis and target funding to the communities that have been hardest hit, Black communities, Native communities, Latinx communities, and Asian uh, communities. So we think that the record turnout that you started this with um, has to get acknowledged as changing the game in the midst of multiple crises and a racial reckoning that our government needs to answer the demands of black communities and all of us that support that racial reckoning across race um, together stem the uh, spread of the virus and create good living wage jobs for all the workers that have been negatively impacted by uh, the current Congress favoring corporations and not working people. We just moved $3 trillion of uh, assistance from our government that went mostly to corporations and not to working people. And we need to reset the balance and um, make sure that working people and communities of color get the backing they need to conquer the, vi the spread of the virus and to get to work in good jobs that this government has the capacity to create in caregiving and in green infrastructure that I think will be game changing for working people in our communities. Well, we absolutely appreciate the leadership that SEIU has exhibited in fighting for racial justice, in fighting uh, for black lives and in fighting for immigrant rights. And that leadership will be uh, even more essential uh, coming up. And so uh, I, I wanted to ask, because it was a labor and community of color alliance that elected uh, the uh, Biden-Harris ticket, uh, what do you see as the priorities for the first 100 days of the new administration? Well, there has to be a massive government investment in um, uh, tackling the virus, but that massive investment in our minds has to be combined with restructuring the economy and writing in black and brown women who have done work that's been excluded since the founding of our nation, and that's caregiving. And we think when black and brown and immigrant women who showed up in record numbers to create this transformation in our government can get invested in, uh, they will be armed to make sure that they can um, care for elders and children safely um, as we tackle the virus as a nation. That's just one example, uh, Kent, of the, the priority. It's, it's an orientation that our government needs to adopt 
as uh, we do the COVID relief package, we think the relief package ought to be combined with recovery that creates structural reform and tackles structural racism in the economy, employment, healthcare, along with creating good jobs at the same time. And that's possible to do. There's lots of great ideas that have been advanced um, that we think actually Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris advanced in the Build Back Better plan that we just need to bring to life in the first action of government. That's great. And Joe Biden has already gone on record saying he wants to be the most pro-labor president since FDR. That's so right. uh, let's make sure that uh, he lives up to that promise. Uh, yes. You know, SEIU, as the union that represents more healthcare workers than uh, any other union in the country, uh, is at a critical place in terms of not only advocating for um, health care for all, but also to, in the midst of this pandemic, to demand, uh, you know, health and safety standards for health care workers. And so uh, what is SEIU doing on these fronts, both in terms of health care reform, as well as protecting the safety of health care workers? Well, what we what we fought for this year in the CARES Act and have been fighting for in the HEROES Act that too long and that we will fight for in the next action of Congress is to make sure that working people have access to affordable and in most cases free health care um, connected to the pandemic. Um, you and I both know that 64 million service and care workers do not have access to affordable healthcare coverage when they're employed by an employer that offers healthcare, but their wages don't allow them to afford it. And therefore they're ineligible for Medicaid coverage in the states where Medicaid's been expanded, but in the states where it hasn't been expanded, like we said in Georgia and Florida, people excluded. So the first action of government has to make sure everybody has access uh, to healthcare coverage, to testing, and to the vaccine um, without a cost. And then the second is to reinforce uh, the Affordable Care Act and strengthen the public option, uh, which is part of the Democratic platform and what uh, President-elect Biden has already offered. And we will be fighting to make that a part of the first actions of government when the new Congress is installed. That's great. And, you know, the pandemic has uh, proven to all that we need healthcare access to for everybody. And yes. no one is safe unless all of us have healthcare coverage. And so right. uh, we are counting on uh, SEIU to help to uh, uh, deliver this uh, uh, with, the, with the, the partnership with the new administration. Uh, my last question, Mary Kay, is that um, SEIU has uh, increasingly taken on broader fights that really address the entire working class, the fight for 15, the fight for fast food workers. And this has gone beyond your traditional base of public sector, healthcare, building service workers. And so why is it that you think it is important for SEIU to broaden its own horizon and target with regard to addressing broader concerns of low wage workers? You're on mute. Our members realized that they couldn't improve their own lives unless we tackled the increasing economic and racial inequality uh, in this nation. And that 64 million workers in the service and care sector who earned less than 15 had no regular scheduled hours, most of whom have no uh, extra benefits than a wage, um, was holding uh, wages and benefits down for all working people. So it was in our self-interest, Kent, to throw the doors of our union open and to make sure that we were having a fight on behalf of everybody uh, who worked for a living in order to do right by our own members, but also to intervene on the grossest racial and economic inequality in our generation. And so our union has a tradition of always fighting for workers that have been excluded. We were born by immigrant flat janitors, you know well from LA, um, the fight to include home care workers who were written out, the family child care workers that were written out. We wanna write in workers that have been excluded based on race and gender. Uh, into the fullness of the economy. Because if we can't raise wages and create good jobs in the service economy, everybody in America um, 
is not going to do better. So we have to raise the wages and create good jobs in the in the poverty wage sector of the economy if all working people are going to do better. Unionized members and non-union across transportation, communication, tech, all of it. So for us, it was a theory of about power. How do our own members get more power? And how do all working people have enough power to uproot structural racism and to confront the, the stranglehold that corporations have on our democracy? Thank you so much, Mary Kay Henry, president of the Service Employees International Union. It was great to have you join us on Labor's Voice. And we really uh, look forward to uh, working with you uh, into the new administration and to make the types of changes that this country so desperately needs. So thank you again, Mary Kay. Thank you. I'm going to leave you in the very good hands of April Barrett and Ron Herrera. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, our next speaker is um, the president of the Service Employees International Union, Local 2015, uh, representing over 300,000 uh, long-term care and home care workers in the state of California. Welcome, April Barrett. And the first question to you is, as one of the uh, unions representing uh, one of the most diverse workforces, including uh, more women and people of color who represent uh, the um, large majority of your membership, uh, why is it important for uh, SEAU 2015 to not only be a non-racist union, but as you have said, to be an anti-racist union? Thanks, Kent. Let me first say hello to you and to Ron, and thank you to everyone who put this together, and shout out to, to my good friend and leader, Mary Kay. Um, listen, at 2015, our members are very clear. Just as you heard Mary Kay talk about low-wage workers dragging down the standards for all other workers in this country, the same exists for um, workers relates to racism. We will not be able to achieve the type of economic justice that our members and that every other worker in this country deserves if we do not dismantle the systemic and institutional and deeply embedded racism that permeates um, everything in our country. The reality is that this country was born out of stealing land, right, for economic gain. This country was born out of the, the, the enslavement and economic exploitation of Africans um, to, to build the wealth of this country. And if we don't start with that analysis that it's all built, right, out of the sickness that was slavery and that was the genocide of the native peoples, we won't get anywhere, right? We won't win. And so we start from an anti-racist place to know that the fight for economic justice is inextricably, inextricably linked with the fight for racial justice. And so our union wants to make sure we are leading the way um, so that we can create a new path forward for all workers. That's very exciting. And it's the type of leadership that is so uh, much needed in uh, the labor movement. Uh, this was a, a union that was uh, fought for and built by women of color and it is uh, led by women of color. And so uh, uh, the presence of SAIU 2015 brings tremendous uh, energy to the broader labor movement. One of the other things that really characterizes 2015, which is quite distinct, is that I've been to your amazing membership meetings that are translated into Spanish and to Chinese and Korean and Armenian. Uh, and you've been at the forefront of the fight for uh, immigrant rights. Why do you think this is an important component of the work of 2015? We believe that that the union movement needs to embrace people as their as in, as their whole selves, right? We all come to the union from different backgrounds, from different countries, speaking different languages, having different cultures, and to really um, and we believe that we have to center our members, their their development, center their power, and you have to be able to embrace um, someone as their whole self. And that means allowing them to communicate in the way that they are most comfortable. And so we make sure we lower the barrier for participation in our union in a way that makes people, hopefully, makes our members feel comfortable, right? That they can bring all of their talents, all of their cultures into our union, which 
helps us build our powerful, right? Our We are fond of saying our power comes from our diversity. And so what may seem chaotic to some with all of our translators and interpreters and all of the languages is just how we roll at 2015. That's great. And I wish more unions would uh, build of that model and truly embrace uh, the large and growing immigrant workforce that is increasingly uh, a critical part of the uh, US working class. Um, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, 40% of the fatalities uh, mm -hmm. have been uh, uh, patients in uh, long-term care facilities. And uh, as a union that represents uh, home care workers and long-term care workers, uh, what is the union doing about uh, this uh, huge challenge uh, with regard to the health and safety concerns of uh, not only your members, but uh, healthcare workers generally? Yeah, Kim, we represent about 25,000 nursing home workers here in the state of California. And since the very beginning of this pandemic, um, even before many folks here in, in our country and in the state knew what COVID was, our members knew something was wrong, right? And they knew that they didn't have that access to the N95 masks that they needed. They knew that surgical gowns were being rationed. And so since the very beginning, we have worked to hold employers accountable to meet the basic, the basic safety needs, right, of our members. Adequate medical grade PPE for all workers and facilities. The proper training and protocols that, that you need to be able to, to, to do your work, right? You, there's no social distancing for nursing home workers. This is up close and personal work. You gotta lay your hands on people. So how can you do that? and protect yourself and also protect that resident. So the what's the proper training protocols that need to be in place? How are people allowed to take time off, right? To make sure that they don't have to make the, the hard choice of going to work when they know they've been exposed or they know that they aren't feeling well. But, you know, these are low wage workers. They can't afford to miss, you know, a, a paycheck. And so how are protections in place to make sure people keep a check coming in even if they have to quarantine? Um, access to testing, right? Our members, just like everybody else, were at, was at the back of the line. Um, and so making sure testing was readily available. It's sad to say that in some of our facilities, it has gotten a lot better. But in some of our facilities, um, we are still fighting for those very basic protections that workers need. And, and we will continue to make sure that our members and the safety and the safety of, safety of the residents they care for is, is those needs are met. That's great. And uh, uh, you know the, the role of the union has been so critical in fighting for PPEs and fighting for uh, health and safe work conditions and, and in educating uh, your members to make sure that they uh, will make these demands at the work site. One of the initiatives that the LA County Federation of Labor and other unions throughout California have been advancing is this whole demand around public health councils which would mm -hmm. empower workers uh, at the front lines to demand uh, healthy and safe work conditions. Tell me a little about um, the role of uh, SEIU 2015 in this uh, campaign. So we were happy to partner with Ron and the Labor Federation, you know, and other unions to help pass um, the, the measure around public, self, public health councils to make sure workers have a voice, right? That nursing home workers and grocery workers and delivery folk and truck drivers, right? That everyone has a say that they can stand up and say, hey, right, we don't have what we need in, in our workplace to keep ourselves safe. And I have ideas, right, about the safety precautions um, that are necessary. So to really continue to make sure the voices of working people are heard and that there is space to, to make sure those voices are allowed. That's great. And uh... Uh, you know, not only has this had impact uh, with workers here in the state of California, but the demand for public health councils has resonated across the country. And so mm -hmm. unions all over the country are turning to what's happening right here in Los Angeles and California as a model of what workers need to do in the midst of this pandemic to fight for healthy and safe uh, work conditions. So I really congratulate you and the other leaders of the uh, LA labor movement for leading this charge. Um, you know, in spite of the fact that you have this massive union, uh, SEIU 2015 is continuing to grow. And I wanted to congratulate you on a very significant breakthrough with regard to childcare worker organizing 
here in the state of California. Tell me about this organizing campaign and how was it won? Sure. Well, first, I, I have to give props to my brothers, Max Arias and Rico Mendez. They are the leaders at SEIU Local 99 and Local 5 to 1, as well as our sister union, UD, UDW. And those are the locals that actually did the organizing of child care workers. But we were happy to support them. And it's significant because, again, we are talking about a workforce um, of, of mainly women, mainly women of color that do the work of making sure our young children have a safe place to go while their parents work and that they are learning, right? These are not just babysitters, right? These are educators, early educators that are in the most important years of a child's life, making sure that they have access to the proper education that, education that they need so that they can grow up to be healthy, um, vital young people and adults. And so we were happy to support the work of a non of non traditional bargaining, right? To look um, outside of the box from our traditional definition of what a worker may be, and recognize that these childcare providers deserve a voice, um, and that they deserve an organization. And after decades of of working to organize their union, these workers finally won, and we couldn't be more proud of them. That's great to hear. And my last question is: I know that uh, twenty fifteen invested huge resources in the November election, and that it was an alliance between the labor movement and communities of color that uh, you know, re uh, re uh, resulted in a victory for the uh, Biden-Harris uh, ticket. Uh, and so uh, what are your hopes for the new administration, especially in the first 100 days? What are some of your top priorities that you would like to see implemented by the new administration? Sure. So the, the top priority that I am working on that the members of 2015 are focused on is making the Biden care plan a reality. You heard Mary Kay talk a little bit about this. But for the first time, we saw a presidential candidate. Now our president-elect, Joe Biden, he and, and um, our vice president-elect, Kamala Harris, have centered caregivers, have centered the, the care work in an economic plan and their Build Back Better plan. They are calling for the investment of $450 billion into the care infrastructure. And we want to make sure that that plan becomes a reality and because it is so connected to COVID relief. If we can expand access to home and community-based services and make sure this workforce is invested in, we help curb the we help um, bend the curve of COVID because people are not going to be in nursing homes where they are getting sick and dying. They're gonna be allowed to shelter in place at home. So it helps curb, uh, bend the curve. It also can be an economic stimulant, right? We need to invest in low wage workers so that they can put that money back into the economy. So it works as an economic stimulus and it also meets the, the desperately needed racial justice and equity goals that we have as a country. Investing in this workforce is investing in women and people of color. And so we are determined. Home care workers are not gonna go back to the days where we were in the shadows. We are gonna demand investment in our programs, to investment in our workforce. And we know that with our new incoming administration, with Joe and Kamala, we have champions. And we also wanna do that in a way that creates um, unions and creates a pathway to citizenship for immigrant workers. So that's, that's great. Well, thank you so much, April uh, Verrett. Uh, really wish you continued success. And uh, we are so uh, uh, excited about the leadership and the energy that you bring uh, to not only the labor movement here in California, but across the country. So thank, thank you, you, April, so for joining much. us. And thank you, Ron. Happy holidays to you both. Happy holidays. Our uh, uh, final uh, speaker uh, on this uh, edition of Labor's Voice is uh, the president of the 800,000 strong Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, which has emerged not only as the most significant political force in the state of California, but has also engaged in critical work beyond uh, California to help secure victories in uh, other parts of the country, uh, namely uh, Arizona. And so I wanted to uh, uh, lead off by uh, congratulating Ron for uh, all of the work of the LA County Fed in this last election cycle uh, to be uh, one of the uh, 
uh, Electoral College delegates uh, that uh, uh, cast his vote for the uh, 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 Biden-Harris uh, 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 incoming administration, uh, but also to uh, get your uh, take on why um, uh, we got plenty to do right here in California, why so many union members and union leaders in uh, Los Angeles also uh, supported uh, flipping Arizona from red to blue in November. Ron. You're on mute. Sorry about that, Kent. I apologize. I, I want to first start out by acknowledging uh, the general president of SEIU, Mary K. K. Henry, and, and of course, um, April Verrett, my sister here from 2015, who I learned from them all the time. And I learned some things today that, that I'm going to put in my weapon tree. Uh, they're both elegant and, and you know, union leaders uh, nationally. Uh, but with that said, you know, this was a partnership, Kent. You know, a lot of experts, a lot of, uh, you know, the political analysts said that uh, California was really insignificant in the election because it was, it's blue. Uh, but with that said, uh, there's a reason for that. And um, the labor movement, right, looked like uh, uh, the country. We are, if you uprooted us here in Los Angeles and, and put us in Arizona, put us in, in Philadelphia, uh, put us in Georgia, we could assimilate just by looks. So uh, union members understand union members. And one of the things that we wanted to show our significance and our power is to go out and you know engage in these states. Uh, Arizona is key. Obviously, you saw at the at uh, during the count uh, that uh, uh, a lot of uh, their uh, a lot of uh, the the end result um, depended on certain states. Arizona being one of them. Uh, so the way the map is in the country, Arizona is pivotal now. We have to carry Arizona. We have to, you know, progressives in Arizona have to uplift. Latinos in Arizona have to GOTV. Um, like California, like Los Angeles, um, we have to demand respect. We have to demand social uh, justice. We have to demand labor rights. And my family comes from Arizona. I personally know the racial uh, injustice that that you know happened to my family, you know, in particular, uh, in the minds of of uh, Clifton and Marenzi, Arizona. And you know, fifty years later, sixty years later, from uh, my family being there and working there, a lot of that still exists. Um, you know, uh, the uh, SB 1070, you know, that we beat back, I mean, is, is a, uh, an example of that. Um, I don't, last uh, election, I actually spent the last week of um, the election process in Arizona. And, um, you know, there were times that we weren't very welcome there. So to see uh, the unions uh, work so hard, SEIU, especially Unite Here, Local 11, who had a, an entire operation there, uh, the Teamsters, UFCW, just a whole array of unions working, you know, in conjunction with the Arizona uh, AFL was, um, you know, uh, a pleasure to me because uh, this has been a, a you know, an organizing attempt for many, many years. And we finally got over the hump, but it took a lot of work. It took a big partnership, egos aside, uh, union members uh, in Arizona really, you know, uh, came out to the forefront and uh, were really the motivators behind that, that uh, state, you know, being flipped. I believe there was 250 conversations just in one operation that uh, SEIU and um, um, Unite Here uh, uh, built. Um, I know that 
um, David Huerta, my brother from USWW, actually sent folks to uh, Sister Susan Monado from Local 11 in Arizona. Uh, I had I visited Arizona uh, with you know multiple operations, but it just took a team and. Um, Never count California unions out. Never count the LA County Federation out uh, because we did work in Pennsylvania, in Arizona and in Georgia. And those were the key areas uh, that got uh, our candidates, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris elected. So I'm very, very proud of that. Well, congratulations. And that's uh, a remarkable turnaround in Arizona in particular, given it's uh, uh, you know, deep red history, uh, but also the LA County Fed mobilizations that took place in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and Georgia. It absolutely had an impact and it helped to secure uh, the victory of the Biden-Harris ticket in November. Um, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, focus a little on the California races because uh, as you know, although uh, California went resoundingly for um, the Biden-Harris ticket, um, there were critical ballot initiatives that labor was uh, backing that uh, that failed, not, uh, namely the schools and communities first prop 15, affirmative action prop 16, and the uh, gig workers uh, prop 22. So what are your thoughts about this in terms of uh, this um, mixed results uh, that that uh, that came through the November elections? Yeah, it was, you know, it was bittersweet. It was, you know, statewide, you know, we we took our lumps. Uh, but I think that we have to use it as an example to mobilize. Uh, we have to use uh, modern day technology, uh, understand the modern day voter, uh, but create a foundation of, you know, old school organizing and mobilization. But what you saw, uh, Kent, was patented corporate greed. You know, a quarter of a million dollars spent on one proposition. Uh, Prop 22, how do, how do you compete, you know, with a quarter of a million dollars being spent on, on one proposition? Uh, I think that, that we have to, as a union, uh, we have to build uh, a union density as far as education, right? We, we need to, you know, the modern day, the, the current, union member has to understand uh, the importance of a union voting block. And we can still defeat that quarter of a million dollars. I, I truly believe that, uh, but we got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, on Prop 16, I'm very disappointed. I'm a product of affirmative action. I'm not where I'm at, you know, had it not been, a, you know, as a result of that, you know, back, uh, in uh, the mid '70s and early '80s, it, it's uh, it's it's sad that 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 didn't you know pass. But again, you know uh, the responsibility lies on our shoulders. You know, are we just gonna accept it, or are we gonna you know regroup and rise up to the challenge of uh, sticking up for workers, sticking up for workers of color? And, uh, you know, getting beyond this, um, we, I think, uh, can be energized as a result of this loss and the result of this win. So it's on us. And I plan in 2021 to energize the union base here in uh, the Alley County, you know, uh, Federation and through its individual members individual members, not affiliates, members. Absolutely. And so what you said is true, Ron. If the uh, state of California voted the way LA voted, then we would have secured victory on you know, 15, 16, and 22. But mm -hmm. there is a statewide challenge. And what you also said is true, is that uh, corporate greed is alive and well in the state of California. And uh, corporate-dominated policies are alive and well even in the deep blue state of California. And the billionaires are still making billions even during the pandemic. Uh, and so one of the things that has been really noteworthy about the work of the LA County Federation of Labor has been advancing progressive policy even in the midst of the pandemic. So the recall and retention policy, the public health councils, 
So why has this been a centerpiece of the work of the LA County Federation of Labor? We, we want to get back to basics and um, that's worker protections. Uh, Sister April and, and uh, you know, General President Henry uh, said something very profound. Um, you can be protected by a collective bargaining agreement in the workplace. But when you get in your car and you drive home, right, then uh, you, can, you can be victimized by social injustice. So uh, creating, you know, strength in the social justice sphere is very important to the, to, um, you know, the, the union movement. With that said, to run parallel with, with collective bargaining and workplaces, you got to have policy. And it has to be basic worker protections. One of the things, you know, you and I talked about this uh, uh, early on is that the word worker, the word union has to be prevalent in our conversations. And, you know, we can't make excuses for it. So we politically are going to do everything in our power to protect workers. Uh, work, the recall and retention, basic, right? After, you know, uh, uh, an example, right? Hospitality. Once um, hotels um, get, you know, operational, hire back the workers that were there. We're going through a global pandemic. Workers have been laid off by the millions. Uh, if their job comes back, someone who has 10, 15, 20 years of seniority in one you know, uh, uh, hotel, give them their job back. We had to pass policy for that on the uh, healthcare consoles, right? The workplace is an arm of the community of your residents. Uh, and if we can control transmission or infection in the workplace, then we're gonna control it in the community. So that was, uh, you know, our, our basic fundamental, you know, mission. But one of the things that uh, is attached to that policy of the healthcare uh, councils is uh, anti-retaliation uh, piece, where at, if, you know, Kent Wong speaks up in the workplace that his employer uh, can't retaliate against him. And that's like extremely important. Again, it's basic fundamental, you know, protection of worker rights and worker empowerment. And that's the big thing because that empowerment is gonna, um, you know, uh, generate uh, GOTV possibilities because they're more aware um, it's going to create uh, more success in organizing drives and union organizing drives. So uh, policy is key. Uh, the, um, this week, uh, the Los Angeles County or the Los Angeles City Council passed um, hazard pay for grocery workers and also uh, Long Beach. Well deserved. I mean, grocery workers are in the front line of the attack from this virus. So shame on those corporations that don't value their employees enough to uh, help them secure, you know, a life uh, during COVID that makes it a little better for them, you know, at home uh, with, their, with, their, with their family budgets. And uh, if we have to do it uh, policy-wise, then so be it. That's great. I mean, one thing that's really distinguished the leadership of the LA County Federation of Labor is that you have helped to uh, build organizing victories. The organizing victories have helped to build political victories. And now the political victories have helped to secure policy victories that actually improve the lives of workers. And uh, it is a very uh, impressive uh, agenda that the LA County Federation of Labor has been advancing to really represent the hopes and aspirations of millions of people, not only here in Los Angeles, but throughout California and throughout the country. The last question today, uh, Ron, uh, really focuses in on the call to action. You know, uh, we talked about with Mary Kay that um, uh, unfortunately the November 3rd election has not 
quite over. We still have two critical seats in uh, Georgia, which will determine who will lead uh, the US Senate uh, for the coming years. So uh, what is the LA County Federation of Labor doing with regard to the campaigns in Georgia? Um, during the beginning of COVID, let me start there. Uh, we built a volunteer program within the Federation. And we took that volunteer program and we incorporated it into phone banking. Uh, and we're gonna do the same thing for Georgia. We have, working with the AFL and some of our other affiliates, uh, we are going to create a robust phone banking system into Georgia with our union volunteers. Uh, we're ready to go. We're not short of volunteers. So um, it's very, very important that uh, we do that. Plus uh, we uh, are fundraising for some of the unions that are there on the ground. And uh, you know that's very, very important. We're reaching out to our 300 affiliates for uh, financial aid for them. And we're asking uh, for physical volunteers uh, to go to Georgia with the, in the uh, Unite uh, Here Local 11 program there. So I just spoke with um, the president of Local 132, the utility workers, Eric Kaufman, and uh, he'll be uh, leaving for Georgia the day after Christmas. So we're encouraging that. And That's Kent, great. Yeah, Kent, if, if you have some spare time after Christmas, let me know, we'll, we'll get a flight for you. We're, we're mobilizing uh, everyone we can to help to support these campaigns. And uh, the labor movement in California is actively supporting it. So we have a slide. Uh, we'll close the program with the slide that will let people know what they can do to actually uh, sign up to participate in some of the phone banking activities that are helping to mobilize the vote in the state of Georgia. So um, here's the information. Uh, phone bank for the 2021 Georgia runoff election. Um, we can help flip these Georgia seats from California. The shifts on Zoom are Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, Tuesday, 3 to 6 p.m., Thursday, 3 to 6 p.m., Saturday, 9 to 12 p.m. So please contact Hugo Romero at the LA County Federation of Labor if any of you can uh, get involved. This is a critical election. This is a critical race. These seats will determine the future of who controls the U.S. Senate for years to come. And so we really uh, want to encourage um, you to get out there to support um, the uh, voter mobilization program in Georgia. Thank you so much, Brother Ron Herrera. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, and we really uh, look forward to continuing to support the work of the LA County Federation of Labor on organizing, on politics, and on policy. Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, month's um, Labor's Voice, and we will see you again in January of 2021. We wanted to wish everybody a healthy, safe uh, holiday season. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kent.